to our service uh, this evening here at the Tron. If you're visiting with us, then uh, you're very welcome indeed, and uh, we hope we'll have a chance after the formal part of the service to uh, meet, to greet one another, encourage one another in the Lord. There'll be uh, refreshments and so on at the front here and downstairs, and if you don't have to rush away, please do stay and uh, enjoy that time together. We're going to begin now, though, with singing, and uh, you'll find the words of the hymn at number 196 in these blue hymn books. Uh, Praise to the Lord, the Almighty, the King of creation. O my soul, praise Him, for He is your health and salvation. Number 196. as we sit, let's join our hearts together in prayer. Let's pray. 
Our Lord and our God, we do come before you this night with rejoicing, with praise, filling our hearts and gladly tripping off our tongues and our lips as together we praise you and we bring our adoration to you as we're commanded along with all that has life and breath. We praise you, Lord, for your creative power molding and shaping this world in its beauty and its complexity and its wonder. We praise you for your wonderful providential care over this whole universe, reigning mightily over all things that you've made, keeping us safe, sustaining this planet and every other, giving us life and breath food and clothes, giving us so much that is full of joy and gladness, so much to rejoice in in this world that you've made for all mankind, reigning such blessing, such generosity, even on those who ignore you, even upon those who scorn and hate you. So great is your generous love. But Lord, we who know you, who know the wonder of your glorious gospel of redemption, we praise you above all for all that you've done for us. When darkness and sin were abounding in our lives, you reached down and touched us. You broke forth as light, you scattered the terrors of night, the powers of darkness, and you rescued us from the bondage of sin, from the slavery that we were in, to sin and to death itself. You shone your light into our hearts and into our lives, and you gave us a hope that will never disappoint, a hope that is sure and certain, a hope of everlasting life shared with your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, who even now has gone before us and shown the way. He is risen from the dead, never to die again. And we look to him and to his great return to bring us, to share with us that life that he has won for us. So, Lord, in the midst of a world of great uncertainties, in the midst of great frailty and weakness, some of us tonight very conscious of that in our own lives, often in the midst of mystery, many things that would confound us. What a, 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 an encouragement, what a comfort it is to us to know that nothing can ever confound you and nothing can prevent your plan and purposes for our lives and for this world. So, Lord, we come together this evening from our many different places, many different backgrounds, many needs, different situations. But every one of us who knows you knows that we come to the one who knows us deeply, intimately, and has promised to guard us and to keep us, to provide for us, to strengthen us, to help us, to walk with us every step of that road to your glory. So, Lord, draw near to us, we pray tonight, whether we come with hearts full of joy and singing and praise comes easily to us, or whether it's very different and we're conscious of a heaviness, a sadness, or perhaps great perplexity or anxiety, things to face in this coming week, burdens that we bear for our friends, for family, for loved ones, through illness, or just through worry about the life that they're leading or the life that they're not leading. Lord, you know our hearts as we come to you. And what a joy it is to know that although many private thoughts, private feelings are represented here tonight, things perhaps that we could not tell to anyone else on this earth, that our hearts are open to you as we gather in your presence as your temple, the place where you have chosen to dwell and indeed delight to dwell, we can know that you are here and that you see us. You see deep into the darkest recesses of our hearts and still you know us and you love us. 
and you promise to meet with us, to feed us, and to nourish us with your word of life and truth. So come to us, Lord, we pray. As we come to your open word, we thank you for its light and for its life. We pray that every one of us tonight would find that afresh in these your words. That you would send us away rejoicing, comforted, encouraged, strengthened, enabled for another week of serving you and loving you and following you with all of our heart and all of our soul. So help us, we pray. Help us as we sing, as we respond in prayer, as we listen to your word, and afterwards as we encourage one another and seek to minister to one another, that we might better serve together our great God and Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. So, Lord, hear our prayers, we ask. We ask all these things in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, let me just uh, mention one or two notices. Uh, obviously, a number of things are uh, in recess for the summer, but uh, we do meet this Wednesday evening at 7.30 to gather uh, for prayer. So please do come and join us if you possibly can. Obviously, people are away and there'll be uh, gaps. So uh, we need the strength of numbers as we come to pray to the Lord for his work throughout the world and also for the work here and for the many camps and missions and so on going on uh, at this time. So Wednesday, 7.30 uh, please do join us. On f Thursday evening and Friday evening, our young workers and students' Bible studies and our Farsi Bible studies are taking place as usual. Uh, if you want to find out more about those, if you don't know about them, please do ask somebody. Uh, after the service, speak to me, speak to somebody with a badge. They'll be very happy to tell you more about that and uh, to point you in the right direction. Well, we're going to uh, shortly read the scriptures, or at least Bob is going to come and read the scriptures for us. But before we do that, we're going to sing once again. And uh, it's number 737. O oh, matchless beauty of our God, so ancient and so new, kindle in us your fire of love. Fall on us as the dew. Here's a, a song that Christians have been singing for, well, 1,600 years and more. It's translated from uh, the words of Augustine of Hippo. So let's join our voices to those down the ages singing this beautiful hymn uh, about our Lord Jesus Christ. Number 737.
now you'll find our reading on page 590. Page 590, we're returning to the prophecy of Isaiah. Now, it's quite some time since we looked at that. I'm not expecting anyone to remember when we, when we looked at chapter 29. So I've put on your seats this Ladybird Guide to Isaiah, which attempts to put it into manageable, manageable sections. We are in this, we're in section 3, chapters 28 to 39. You'll see at the bottom, Zion, Jerusalem, is threatened and it's saved, but future exile is promised. And just a quick word here, Isaiah prophesied for over 40 years during the reign of four kings, Jotham, Uzziah, Ahaz, and Hezekiah. But it's particularly Ahaz and Hezekiah who concern us. In the earlier part of the book, Isaiah prophesied to the faithless, godless Ahaz and said, if you do not stand firm in faith, you will not stand at all. And now in these chapters, we're into the reign of the good king Hezekiah, a man who had his faults, his failures, and his flaws, but nevertheless was a faithful and godly man. And the background is the threat of Assyria, that gigantic superpower up on the Tigris there, ready to gobble up the little nations. And in these circumstances, Hezekiah's advisors are pressing him, trust in Egypt, go to the other superpower to protect us. And this is probably in the early years of the king before his reforms had managed to take effect. So that's the situation here as we read chapters 30 and 31 quite a long reading, but the chapters go together, and chapter 31 is fairly brief. So let's hear the word of the Lord, Isaiah chapter 30, page 590. Ah, or perhaps better, woe, stubborn children, declares the Lord, who carry out a plan, but not mine, and who make alliance, but not of my spirit, that they may add sin to sin, who set out to go down to Egypt without asking for my direction to take refuge in the protection of Pharaoh and to seek shelter in the shadow of Egypt. Therefore shall the protection of Pharaoh turn to your shame and the shelter in the shadow of Egypt to your humiliation. For though his officials are at zone and his envoys reach Haines, everyone comes to shame through a people that cannot profit them, that brings neither help nor profit, but shame and disgrace an oracle on the beasts of the Negev. Through a land of trouble and anguish, from where come the lioness and the lion, the adder and the flying fiery serpent, they carry riches on the backs of donkeys and their treasures on the humps of camels to a people that cannot profit them. Egypt's help is worthless and empty. Therefore I have called her Rahab, who sits still. And now, Go write it before them on a tablet and describe it in a book that it may be for the time to come as a witness forever. For well, they are a rebellious people, lying children, children unwilling to hear the instruction of the Lord, who say to the seers, do not see, and to the prophets, do not prophesy to us what is right. Speak to us smooth things, prophesy illusions, leave the way, turn aside from the path. Let us hear no more from the Holy One of Israel. Therefore, thus says the Holy One of Israel, because you despise this word and trust in oppression and perverseness and rely on them, therefore this iniquity shall be to you like a breach in a high wall bulging out and about to collapse, whose breaking comes suddenly in an instant. And its breaking is like that of a potter's vessel that is smashed so ruthlessly among its fragments, not a shard is found from which to take fire from the hearth or to dip up water out of the cistern. For thus says the Lord God, the Holy One of Israel, in returning and rest, you shall be saved. In quietness and in trust shall be your strength. But you're unwilling and you said no. We will flee upon horses. Therefore, you shall flee away and said we will ride upon swift steeds, therefore your pursuers shall be swift. A thousand shall flee at the threat of one, 
At the threat of five you shall flee, till you are left like a flagstaff, a flagstaff on the top of a mountain, like a signal on a hill. Therefore the Lord waits to be gracious to you, and therefore he exalts himself to show mercy to you. For the Lord is a God of justice. Blessed are all those who wait for him. For a people shall dwell in Zion. In Jerusalem he shall weep no more. He will surely be gracious to you at the sound of your cry. As soon as he hears it, he answers you. And although the Lord give you the bread of adversity and the water of affliction, yet your teacher will not hide himself any more. But your eyes shall see your teachers. And your ears shall hear a word behind you saying, This is the way. Walk in it. When you turn to the right or when you turn to the left, then you will defile your carved idols overlaid with silver and your gold-plated metal images. You will scatter them as unclean things. You will say to them, Be gone. And he will give rain for the seed with which you will sow the ground and bread the produce of the ground which will be rich and plenteous. In that day your livestock will graze in large pastures, and the oxen and the donkeys that work the ground will eat seasoned fodder, which has been winnowed with shovel and fork. And on every lofty mountain, every high hill, there will be brooks running with water in the day of great slaughter when the towers fall. Moreover, the light of the moon will be as the light of the sun, and the light of the sun will be sevenfold, as the light of seven days, in the day when the Lord binds up the brokenness of his people and heals the wounds inflicted by his blow. Behold, the name of the Lord comes from afar, burning with his anger and in thick rising smoke. His lips are full of fury and his tongue is like a devouring fire. His breath is like an overflowing stream that reaches up to the neck to sift the nations with the sieve of of destruction and to place on the jaws of the people a bridle that leads astray. You shall have a song as in the night when a holy feast is kept and gladness of heart as when one sets out to the sound of the flute to go to the mountain of the Lord, to the rock of Israel. And the Lord will cause his majestic voice to be heard and the descending blow of his arm to be seen in furious anger and a flame of devouring fire with a cloudburst and storm and hailstones. The Assyrians will be terror-stricken at the voice of the Lord when he strikes with his rod, and every stroke of the appointed staff that the Lord lays on them will be to the sound of tambourines and lyres. Battling with brandished arm, he will fight with them. For a burning place has long been prepared. Indeed, for the king it is made ready, its pyre made deep and wide, with fire and wood in abundance. The breath of the Lord, like a stream of sulphur, kindles it. Woe to those who are down to Egypt for help, and rely on horses, who trust in chariots because they are many, and in horsemen because they are very strong. But do not look to the Holy One of Israel or consult the Lord. And yet he is wise and brings disaster. He does not call back his words, but will arise against the house of the evildoers and against the helpers of those who work iniquity. The Egyptians are man and not God, and their horses are flesh and not spirit. When the Lord stretches out his hand, the helper will stumble and he who is helped will fall, and they will all perish together. For thus the Lord said to me, As a lion or a young lion growls over his prey, and when a band of shepherds is called out against him, is not terrified by their shouting or daunted at their noise, so the Lord of hosts will come down to fight on Mount Zion and on its hill like birds hovering, so the Lord of hosts will protect Jerusalem. He will protect and deliver it. He will spare and rescue it. Turn to him from whom people have deeply revolted, O children of Israel. For in that day, everyone shall cast away his idols of silver and his idols of gold, which your hands have sinfully made for you. And the Assyrian shall fall by a sword, not of man, and a sword, not of man, shall devour him. 
and he shall flee from the sword, and his young men shall be put to forced labor. His rock shall pass away in terror, and his officers desert the standard in panic, declares the Lord, whose fire is in Zion, and whose furnace is in Jerusalem. Amen. This is the word of the Lord. People in Isaiah's time were told that they were carrying out a plan, but not the Lord's, and made an alliance, but not of the Spirit. So we sing 525, Wind of God, Dynamic Spirit, breathe upon our hearts today. For a few moments, as the musicians play, we'll take up the offering.
Now let's pray together. The letter to the Hebrews says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him. Father, we thank you indeed as the musicians have played. Thank you, O oh, our Father, for giving us your Son and sending your Spirit till the work on earth is done. And as we think of the great cloud of witnesses, Father, we thank you for those who throughout the long centuries have kept the faith, have run the race, and have finished the course. Many of these are known to us and loved by us. Others, long before our time, no doubt others after our time, will continue that race until the work on earth is done. I want to thank you, Lord, for those who gave us the Scriptures, for Moses, to whom the first revelation was given, for the prophets, the poets, the historians, the wisdom writers who followed and who in time became part of your living word to us, along with the apostles. Father, we praise you for this word, the word of life that fires us, speaks to our souls, and sets our hearts ablaze. And we thank you for all those today and in past generations who have, by their lives and by their lips, carried that message to the far parts of the earth. And we pray, Lord, as we prayed this morning for the many camps and the many, the many other activities taking place among the young and among all age groups to bring that glorious gospel, that gospel which can rescue people from sin and death and change them into the children of God. And for all of us, Lord, we pray that we may rejoice in your grace that we may tremble at your word and by our living and speaking be faithful servants. O oh God, the strength of all those who put their trust in you, mercifully accept our prayers. And because through the weakness of our mortal nature we can do nothing good without you, grant us the help of your grace that in the keeping of your commandments we may praise you both in will and in deed. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Now, before we look at the Isaiah passage, we're going to sing once again, number 527, about that same spirit, the spirit term, the source of the old prophetic fire, and the one by whom the prophets wrote and spoke. Number 527, Spirit of God, our hearts inspire.
Uh, could I ask you please to have our, your Bibles open at page 590 and we'll pray and ask the Lord's help. Father, indeed we pray that the Spirit of God, source of the old prophetic fire, who spoke through your servants, the prophets, and spoke through your servant Isaiah in the 8th century of BC, will now use these same words to speak to us, because we believe that these were words not just for the prophet's time, but these were words for all time, for for us upon whom the ends of the ages have come. We pray that there will be a light that shines in a dark place until the day dawn and the morning star rises. We ask this in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. <clears throat> so Isaiah 30 and 31. A prominent figure in, in 19th century Paris was a man called Charles Blondin. He was a trapeze artist, very famous, he attracted enormous crowds night after night. And in middle life, he decided to emigrate to America. And one of his stunts there was to stretch a tightrope across the Niagara Falls and walk across it. That wasn't enough for Blondin. He pushed a wheelbarrow over it as well. And the story is told, although this is probably not true, that he once stopped in the middle of the tightrope and cooked an omelette on the wheelbarrow. And as they say, if you believe that, Anyway, he used to invite people to sit in the wheelbarrow. He said, how many of you believe I can cross this safely? Oh, yes, of course. Well, who is going to sit in the barrow? He had very, very few takers. Now, trusting in the Lord is very different from trusting in a trapeze artist, obviously. Nevertheless, In all trust, in all faith, there is an element of risk. We don't know exactly what's going to happen. Indeed, the father of the faithful himself, Abraham, we are told, went out in faith, not knowing where he was going. And this is what these chapters are about. It's about the idea of trust, the idea of faith, which dominates. Um, Who do we trust and who deserves our trust. That's why the theme tonight is trust and obey. I think it's very important actually, trust is not primarily a feeling. There will be many times we don't feel faithful. There will be many times we find it hard to trust. Did I be very, very surprised if in this room and elsewhere this evening, many people are finding it very, very hard to have faith. Very, very hard to trust. And that's what obedience is so important. Obedience means risking when we don't feel like it. Obedience means obeying even if we think it will do us harm. That is the the situation here in these chapters. We're in great danger, a world of great turmoil, Who are we going to trust and whose word are we are we going to obey so that's the theme for this evening trust and obey I want to ask two particular questions because there are two possibilities here trust in Egypt or trust in the Lord so the first question is why is it wrong to trust in Egypt and the second one is why is it right to trust in the Lord. So we have to ask the question, who or what is Egypt? Now at the time, obviously, as I said, it's a military state. No longer it had the enormous power it had had many centuries before, but it was still a very, very formidable power. And Hezekiah's Hezekiah's counselors were saying, trust in Egypt, because Egypt will protect us from Assyria. Assyria, the great superpower is on the Tigris, capital Nineveh, which is actually on the site of the modern town of Mosul, which you've heard about a great deal in the 
news about the Islamic State and so on. Anyway, that makes sense. We're faced with a great bully. Let's bring in a bigger bully. If the playground bully is going to attack you, let's get a bigger bully to attack him. Now, Egypt here is what the New Testament calls the world. John says, do not love the world. Do not trust in the world. Paul, at the end of his life, um, laments that Demas has forsaken him because he loved the world. Now, we must be clear what this means. What is the world? Now, in my youth, this was seen purely in external terms, and some of you would have been brought up this way as well, concerned with what we ate and drank, concerned with leisure time, concerned with um, whether we engaged in worldly activities. Sport was not to be countenanced. Theatre, music, all the kind of things that so enrich life were frowned on and they were called the world. Now, of course it's true. Any of these can be a temptation. Anything can be a temptation and take us away from the Lord. But we must avoid that kind of fanaticism. Otherwise, our faith will simply depend on externals, which can be, which can be seen and which can be touched. The world sometimes called Egypt, sometimes called Babylon, sometimes called Sodom, is the anti-God spirit that finds its whole meaning, its whole purpose in the present day, in what can be seen, what can be touched, what can be tasted. Well, that's the situation then. Now, sometimes when you're trying to work out what something is, it's quite a good idea to decide what it's not because that's, that helps to be more precise. Well, why is it wrong to trust Egypt? Now, we must avoid fanaticism. God can and often does do wonderful things. But God more normally works through means. And to say we're going to trust in the Lord doesn't mean, for example, if you have money to buy food, that you expect manna from heaven. That's not going to happen. If you are ill, it doesn't mean you don't have to go and see a doctor. It doesn't mean, as I've heard some people say, you shouldn't take out insurance policies because that's not trusting, trusting in God, that's trusting in Egypt. The point is, you can see all these things as good provision for God, for our lives on earth. Oh, of course, if, they are, if, we, if we idolize them, if we see them as things on which you must depend, then they become wrong. The story is told, doubtlessly apocryphal, of a man who was, who was drowning. And he is a Christian man. He prayed to the Lord. The Lord would save him. That moment, a strong swimmer passed and offered to help. Oh, no, 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 I don't need you. The Lord will provide. And then a boat passed. Same response. The Lord will provide. And then a helicopter. Same response. The Lord will provide. No doubt he thought, I can't trust in Egypt. The inevitable happened. He was drowned. When he met the Lord, the apocryphal story goes, he says to the Lord, why didn't you rescue me from drowning? And the Lord said, I tried three times, and you wouldn't accept the help. So trusting in Egypt is not being fanatical and tr turning aside the gifts that God sends us. So what is trusting in Egypt, and why is it so wrong? Well, you see, first of all, trusting in Egypt means a denial that God has saved us. Going back to Egypt is actually turning our back on, the, on our salvation, what C.S. Lewis called the pilgrim's regress, going back to the land that God took them out of. And in, this, and in the book of Numbers particularly, we read these stories, the murmuring and the complaining stories. Let's go back to Egypt. Egypt was far more comfortable. Egypt was far more luxurious than this. And so, let's go back. That was the uh, it's expressed in that, those of you who were here this morning, we sang Psalm 95. And Psalm 95 is specifically about that. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. Don't, don't go back to Egypt. Don't, go, don't deny 
that Jesus saves us. You see the Negev of verse 6, an oracle on the beasts of the Negev, the barren land where the, the territory around the Dead Sea slopes down to the Sinai Peninsula. What does it mean for us to go back to Egypt as the Israelites did? For them it was literal. For us it means essentially denying God's power to save and God's power to keep. Can God provide a table in the desert? It's equivalent to denying that. Now, some time ago, a notorious case of the minister in Edinburgh specifically denying that Christ died for our sins. And not only, not only saying that in his own church, but putting it on YouTube so that others could share that, um, could share that message. You see, the point is, Christ died for our sins is a totally unambiguous phrase. There are many difficult phrases in the Bible. That's not one of them. Christ died for our sins is the very essence, the very heart of our salvation. None of us would want to go along with that view. Aren't we often tempted to go back to Egypt ourselves? Look at chapter 31. Woe to those. Rely on horses Trust in chariots and in horsemen, but do not look to the Holy One of Israel. Now, chariots and horses in, in the Old Testament are symbols of power and of strength. Just as we, we looked at last, last Sunday morning in Deuteronomy, Moses says the king is not to build up horses and chariots, not to, not to rely on these. When we decide, or when we imagine that what we do for the Lord is more important than what He has done for us, when we rely on numbers, on buildings, on abilities, all of these God's gifts, then we are in danger of going back to Egypt. God's gifts are gifts given to us so that we can live effectively in this world, given to us so that the church can be built up and God's people blessed. But they become deadly if we trust in them. Because if we trust in these, we are in effect denying grace, are we not? We are saved by grace through faith. I've often said it before that while evangelicals insist that we are saved by grace, we believe, in fact, that we are sanctified by works. Not that our works don't matter, of course, but these works are works of grace. They're not works that earn grace. That's the point. So that's the first thing then. To go back to Egypt, and why it's wrong to trust in Egypt, is because when we trust in Egypt, we deny our salvation. Secondly, it's wrong to trust in Egypt because Egypt is ineffective. If you look at look back again at chapter 30, this mysterious little passage, as it seems, 6 to 7, the oracle on the beasts of the Negev, the Negev that, say once again, that barn area south of the Dead Sea, the scene of many of Abraham's wanderings. And it's talking about sending envoys to Egypt. Back in chapter 4, his officials are at Zon, his envoys reach Haines. This is, um, Zon is in the far north on the Nile Delta, and Haines in the far south, rather like John O'Groats, the land's end. Whereas envoys going down to Egypt, trailing the length and breadth of Egypt, and a very unpleasant journey through a land of trouble and anguish, verse 6, with full of predatory beasts. And also Rahab, who sits still. Now, this isn't Rahab of Jericho. It's a different spelling in Hebrew. This is Rahab the dragon, Leviathan, as the book of Job calls him. This is now the toothless, ineffective dragon. And very often, see, in the prophets, particularly in Ezekiel, Egypt is referred to as Rahab, the monster, a toothless, ineffective monster. All this hard effort, all this long and painful journey through the Negev and then from the north to the south of Egypt to achieve nothing. Rahab 
who sits still, Rahab, Rahab the, who does nothing, ineffective. And when we try to do, use worldly methods to do God's work, that's what happens. I'm not talking about differences of style and techniques. Over the generations, these always change as we try to reach the world, the people of our time. What I'm talking about <clears throat> is the kind, of, the kind of attitude that because the world is changing, the church has to change. And we've seen so much of that. And the kind of, you know, the kind of absolute nonsense that talked. Virtual church, we are told. People live on the internet now, so the church has to live on the internet as well. You never know, suggest that you have virtual baptisms and virtual Lord's Supper. I have no idea how that could happen, but then I'm no computer buff. Perhaps someone would be able to simulate that kind of thing. You see, when we start talking that way, because the world has changed, the church must change as, as well, we are denying the spirit. That's why the passage begins, stubborn children who carry out a plan, but not mine, who make an alliance, but not of my spirit. Egypt is a denial of salvation. Egypt is ineffective. And thirdly, Egypt is temporary. Chapter 31, verse 3. The Egyptians are man and not God. Their horses are flesh and not spirit. Now, flesh is not evil in the Bible. Flesh is fallen, of course, and needs redemption. The point is, flesh is perishable. That is the point. The spirit is life. So even if there appears to be an immediate advantage in trusting Egypt, that advantage will disappear. Because Egypt's help, if it does help, is only for this life. The Egyptians are men, not God. Their horses are flesh and not spirit. They are perishable. It's ultimately choosing death rather than life. It's ultimately choosing decay and disappearance rather than flourishing. Now, I think this is something that we don't sufficiently grasp. We, it's easy to talk about Egypt. It's easy to talk piously, oh, Egypt's the, the world. But when we look at it more closely, it's a denial of the very heart of our salvation. It's ineffective and it's temporary. That's what we need to remember. So, why is it right then to trust in the Lord? Now, of course, in one sense, that question answers itself, doesn't it? But we find it very, very difficult to trust in the Lord, don't we? It's very important to remember it's not about great faith. It's about faith in a great God. Jesus talks about faith like a mustard seed. And why is it right to trust in him? First of all, because we have a relationship with him. My children, 30, verse 1, stubborn children. And then again, later on in verse 9, for they are rebellious people, lying children, children unwilling to hear the instruction of the Lord. And that is at the very heart of the Exodus stories. And I am the Lord, your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt. We trust in God because of our relationship with him, our Father in heaven. That's why we trust in him. Now, it's very important to look at verses 8 and following of chapter 30. Um, one of the many places where Isaiah makes it clear he's not simply talking to his own day. Verse 8, now go write it before them on a tablet and inscribe it in a book it may be for the time to come as a witness forever. Um, you know, it's, this is, he's already said this in, back in chapter 8, verse 16. Write this and preserve it, not like what we're seeing this morning, this word which is passed down from generation to generation. This word which Paul said to Timothy, teach to faithful men who will be able 
to teach it to others. A permanent record. The words he spoke in 8th century BC Jerusalem are for us in the last days. You'll notice once again, and this was also in the passage in Deuteronomy this morning, who say to the seers, do not see, and to the prophets, do not prophesy to us what is right. Leave the way. Speak to us smooth things. Prophesy illusions. These people wanted a ministry which would have no impact on lifestyle, a ministry which you could simply enjoy, go away and say, oh, wasn't a great sermon, a totally bogus view of reality, smooth things, illusions. Because the one thing a false prophet will never tell anyone is that they need to change. A false prophet will say what you need is to develop your potential. You need to, be, you need to believe in yourself and so on. A false prophet will never say, will never tell people to repent will not preach repentance towards God and faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. They'll say things that people want to hear. And that, that's, a daily temp, that's a daily temptation for those who preach or bring the word of God, to say things that people want to hear. It's much more pleasant after all. You give yourself an easier life if you say things that people want to hear. Now, on the other hand, this does not mean that you recognize a true prophet because they're aggressive and brusque and always beating people with a stick. The truth itself is offensive. Grace is offensive. People want to do, contribute to their salvation. People want to, be, to, to stand in the presence of God and basically say, I'm not as other people are. That is the problem, isn't it? It's not, I find very early in my ministry that people prefer the preaching of judgment to the preaching of grace. And the reason for that is very simple, because they always apply judgment to somebody else. Oh, I hope so-and-so was listening, or I wish he had been here to hear that. But grace, nothing in my hand I bring, simply to the cross I cling. And people want to say, worthy am I, rather than worthy is the Lamb. And that's, so there is no need for personal offensiveness. The grace, the, the gospel will offend soon enough. And this word, the word is available, but we need to obey it. We have the privilege of God revealing himself to communities to individuals through his word. So we can have a relationship with him because he has given us his word and his spirit. Suppose we didn't have the Bible. How do you think after thousands of years the faith would have become as it passed down the centuries more and more diluted like Chinese whispers? And that's why when people ignore the Bible that they can say anything they want, anything they like. So, the Bible is the Word of God, not just for the time, but for, the, for every generation. Heaven and earth will pass away, said Jesus, but my words will not pass away. That's the first reason, because he is our Father who loves us and has given us the way to live. Secondly, because he is the life giver, the basic truth about God is that he is the creator. And that, I think, is the point of verses 23 and following. You give rain for the seed and bread, livestock will graze in large pastures. Ultimately, going back to the covenant with Noah, that as long as the earth remains, summer and winter, sowing and harvest, day and night, will never cease. A reminder that all good gifts around us are sent from heaven above. And already here in verse um, 26, going far beyond his own time, far beyond our own time, to 
to the glories of the new creation, which we'll look at in a few weeks in chapters 34 and 35. The light of the moon will be as the light of the sun, the new creation far more glorious than this. Now, Paul in Romans 1 speaks of the danger of worshipping the creation rather than the creator. It's easy to lapse into that. It's easy to lapse into kind of new agey idea of um, the, the earth itself being an object of worship. And the kings of, and so many of the kings of Israel and Judah worship the starry host and so on. But the antidote to that is surely in, in these verses, 19 to 22, we hear and we obey. We see and we walk in the light, as John said. And verse... And, and, and in verse, um, in verse um, nine, 18 sorry, of chapter 30, the Lord waits to be gracious to you, and therefore he exalts himself to show mercy to you. How is that going to happen? Glance back at verse 15. For thus says the Lord, God, the Holy One of Israel, in returning and rest you shall be saved. Returning, of course, is repenting, coming back. And trust shall be in quietness and in trust shall be your strength. We're not ultimately saved by our activism. We're ultimately saved by the action of God in Christ. That's the point. So we trust in him because he is our father. We trust in him because he is the life giver. And we trust in him finally because he is the judge whom each of us will have to give account. He is the one who will have the last word. See, the end of both chapters, chapter 30 and 31, speak of the destruction of Assyria. The immediate context, of course, is the destruction of the Assyrian army before Jerusalem. It's also the last day. In verse 33, for a burning place has long been prepared indeed for the king the king there, of course, is the king of Assyria, but he's also, of course, the king, the king who is Satan and his legions, the place prepared for the devil and his angels. And then again, in, ver in verse 8 of chapter 31, the Assyrians shall fall by a sword, but not of man. It was the angel of the Lord who destroyed the Assyrians. And it points to the final judgment fire, the fire of God. Now, what have we read before in Isaiah of the fire of God? Remember chapter 6, when Isaiah had his great vision of the God exalted in glory, and before him stood the seraphim, the burning ones. And Isaiah felt his own sinfulness, woe is me. And how was that cured? one of the seraph took a live coal from the altar and touched his lips. That fire that burned and destroyed also purified and cleansed. What was true of Isaiah would be true of the people of that day and the people of this day. If we come back to him in returning and in rest, you shall be saved in quietness and in in trust shall be your strength. See, there really is no other way to trust the promises and to obey the commands. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we are so prone to go down to Egypt for help. We're so prone to trust in our own abilities and we are so prone not to trust in your great power and in your great love. Oh, help us day by day to return to you, the maker of our souls, our Father in heaven, the one who loves us, the one who sent his Son who gave to give himself for us, and the one who sent his Spirit to make that real in our hearts and lives. This is our prayer this evening, our Father. Amen.
and trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. Number 853, when we walk with the Lord. <coughs> Now to him who is able to keep us from falling and to present us blameless before his glory with shouts of joy, to the only God our Savior be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority. May he walk with us through all our lives and bring us in the light of grace to the light of glory. Amen. <laughs> 